3. Romans chapter 3. And we want to begin reading with verse 21. And read down through verse 28. Uh, to get as much of this context as we can for our thoughts this morning. It says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, uh, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus." Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? Nay, uh, nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified without the deeds of the law. I want us to uh, look this morning in the statement in verse 24. Uh, which gives us the, the thought for our message. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And we want to talk to you this morning on the subject of the freeness of salvation. The freeness of salvation. Now, the word freely that is used here, uh, the Greek word at 1432, dorian, means without a cause, freely, for naught, in vain. In the Gospel of John, verse 5, or chapter 15, verse 25. But this cometh to pass, this is Jesus speaking here, and showing a, uh, a fulfillment of the Scripture. This cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And that which is translated here, without a cause, is the same word uh, that is used in Romans 3.24 when it says freely. Freely. Without a cause. Uh, he said that the word might be fulfilled. And that word in Psalms uh, 35, 19. He said, let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me. Neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. And so here was a, a prophecy uh, in Psalms, and how many times, uh, you know, Paul referred to David, he was a prophet, and he prophesied this of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, they hated me uh, without a cause. Also, um, <coughs> Psalm 69, 4, again. He said that they hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restore that which I took not away. But anyway, they that hate me without a cause. So that the word that was written in their law, talking about the, the Jews, they are the ones who, that Jesus had given them no cause that they should hate him. They hated him freely. You know. And that is the idea here that we are justified freely 
He does it freely. The, we gave him no cause that he should justify us. Uh, but uh, we are justified freely. We do nothing to justify God saving us. But it's freely by his grace. Being justified freely by his grace. And, and so that's a double a statement there because grace means unmerited favor. And so we want to look at uh, some things here this morning like to discuss the freeness of salvation. It is without cost, without price to us. Now, our first point this morning we'd like to look at is, first of all, man's natural resistance to grace. By nature, man resists the idea that God just freely gives us of salvation. You know, and, and there's a, an old saying, you know, and, and this comes from man's attitude. Nothing's free. We have that. Nothing's free. But when it comes to God saving us, and it's not free, it costs God. It cost Him the life of His Son. There was a price, but it is not a price that you and I have to pay. In 2 Kings, we have the chapter 5, 2 Kings chapter 5. We have an account of, and I believe it's an Assyrian or Syria. Syria was constantly warring with the northern ten tribes of Israel. And in the course of this constant warring, prisoners were taken. And so there's a young Jewish girl that had been taken captive and is serving in the household of one Naaman. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captives out of the land of Israel, a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to... Go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now, when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. <coughs> it wasn't the king in Israel that was the prophet. It wasn't the king that was able to do this. Uh, and it came to pass when the king of Israel read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man does send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. You know, so the king was upset. He thought this, he's just trying to pick a fight here. He's sending me an impossible task to do. Um, and it was so when Eli Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me. 
and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came, and here, you know, here is the mindset. He is a mighty man, a mighty man of valor, a mighty man of war. He is a noble. He is uh, next to the king of Syria. And this mindset, and so he, he was sent with the silver and the gold and the raiment to purchase this great deliverance from leprosy. And so here Naaman, and he has a large entourage, of course, that accompanies him. Uh, Naaman came with his horses, with his chariot, and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Now you have to understand, now he's made this journey all the way from Syria down to Samaria. And there is always, a, in, in the mind of man, we have our preconceived notions as just our nature. And Naaman, of course, and, and that preconceived notions are, are forged by our experiences. And those things that we are exposed to, those things that we experience uh, in the world. Naaman was not free of this fault, and neither are we. It's part of human nature. And Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. And Naaman was upset. I mean, he, he was more than a little disappointed. He became very angry. Says he was wroth. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought. You see, now here's where he reveals uh, some of that preconceived mindset that his worldly experience had prepared him and the expectations that he had. He said, I thought he will surely come out to me. I mean, I'm an important man. And I've come to this prophet. I thought sure, he would come out himself, first of all. Not send a servant. You know, what was it that Goliath said when... You know, am I a dog that you, you send this little shepherd boy out here to do battle with me? I thought you were going to send a champion out. That's kind of the same thing Naaman was thinking here. He, he, he must think I'm nobody. He doesn't even bother to come out himself. He sends his servant out to deal with me. He'd surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place. And, you know, surely there'd be some kind of ceremony. There'd be some kind of hocus pocus, you know, done here. We all have certain ideas how God ought to do things. That's just human nature. Matter of fact, I, I want to do a message. Well, I had a, a thought for a message, and as I was getting into it, I, it's going to have to be a series. <laughs> I'm going to take a month and do this series on, on this one idea. But something of the fall, the effects of the fall, the corruption of our minds. And the way we, the expectations that we form in our own minds. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, he said. And so he start. He, and then he begins to do some are not Abana and uh, far part rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel. And he wants me to dip in that old muddy, dirty Jordan River. To be clean? 
We got better water, you know. Michigan, we boast uh, uh, the water up here. You know, pure Michigan. Well, that's kind of how Naaman felt about the, the, the waters up there in Syria as compared to Israel. It just did not meet up to his expectations at all in any way. So he turned and went away in a rage. I mean, he wasn't just angry. He was in a rage. And that's how man a lot of times reacts when God reveals to him God's plan of salvation. And his servants came near and spake to him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? Well, of course he would. That's what he expected. That's what he was expecting to do. That's what he came prepared for. How much rather than when he said they just wash and be clean? So the wisdom, the advice of the servants prevailed. And he went down, dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. He just did what the man of God said, this is what you need to do. And it worked, just like he said. But you see the initial resistance to God's plan of salvation. Human nature is opposed to submitting to the humiliation of being helpless even before the Almighty God. Naaman felt humiliated. Think about that for a minute. He thought that the prophet would come out and just pay all kinds of honor to him and, 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 and do all this stuff. He was humiliated. He sent his servant out. He didn't have to do anything. He didn't have to... There was no great price. There was no great act. There was nothing. He was humiliated. And that is the nature of man when confronted with his sin and confronted that you are completely helpless and dependent upon the mercy of Almighty God for salvation. There's nothing you have. There's nothing you can do. There's no price you can pay that you may obtain the forgiveness of your sins and eternal life. Man wants to cling, as did Naaman, to the notion that God needs man to do something in order that God may save him. And that's kind of at the root of what Naaman was thinking. He needs me to, I came prepared. I've got silver, I've got gold, I've got raiment. Whatever he asked of me, I'm ready to do. Except go dip seven times in the Jordan River. Let me see. Now Jordan is symbolic of death. We've used it and, and as a result of the centuries of teaching of Christianity, we have kind of come, you know, crossing Jordan. And the picture of the priest bearing the ark in first and the waters parting so that the children of Israel could cross over on dry ground didn't even get the soles of their feet wet as they crossed the Jordan River into the promised land, is a type. 
and seven times, Jesus Christ has completely paid the price. He died the death for our sins completely. Naaman had to learn humility. And the mercy and grace of God is without price. It is beyond any price that man might bring. And so God does it required. He does it freely. Because there's nothing you have, nothing you can do that can pay the price. And that's why His Son paid the price for us. It, it wasn't free, but it is offered freely to you and me. And that brings us to our second point, man's inability to save himself. We kind of touched upon that, but if you look in Romans, Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, he says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become improper. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Well, aren't I an exception to that? No, not one. You see, there's none righteous. There's none that doeth good. There's none that seeketh after God. Man's inability. This is the verdict rendered by God in His Word. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You've already failed. You see. Some people think, well, there's a chance here I can redeem myself. If I do enough good to outweigh the bad. No, the bad that you've already done has brought the eternal condemnation upon you. And what you do cannot take that away. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5.12 Sin entered the world by one man and death by sin. That was the sentence passed upon Adam and upon his posterity. And death is passed. And that word passed is speaking of the sentence that has been passed. As a judge passes sentence. Death, the sentence of death has been passed by the judge upon all men, for all have sinned. So that, that sentence has already been passed. Man's already fallen in Adam and has himself sinned, thus bringing upon himself a just condemnation. God is just, and He's just to condemn man uh, for his sin. John 3, 18 uh, through 21. Again, this is the condemnation. Now, let me... Now, we like John 3, 16. We're all familiar with that. But if you drop down a few verses and continue reading, verse 18, uh, it help if I was in the right chapter. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. That, that sentence of death has already been passed. That's already been adjudicated. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. They're condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Nobody likes to be told you are a sinner. You are unclean. You, in the eyes of God, are considered wicked and 
God has pronounced His judgment upon you. Your, your ways have been condemned. Nobody likes to hear that. You, know, you don't hear much preaching against sin and hell and, and these things these days. Why? Because people don't want to hear it. They don't want to come to the light. They don't want you bringing the light to them either. Because that's the nature. You need to understand that. So they're condemned already. Men love darkness rather than light. And neither do they come to the light. Uh, Romans 1, 21. Because when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, uh, they became fools. And so he describes here and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, and to birds, and to four footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And it goes on down through verse 32. And, and so he talked about being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And so they come not to the light. Notice then in the Gospel of John, verse 6, John 6, 44 and 65. Jesus says, no man can come to me. Now when, I don't know if they still teach this in school or not. It, it's been a while since I've been in, in school. And they're teaching, there's so many things they're not teaching anymore. But I was always taught the difference between can and may. And a lot of times kids will say, well, can I do this? And the parents need to correct them, say, because you're asking it the wrong question. You're asking permission, but you're using the, word, the wrong word to ask permission. Can means am I able. Can speaks of ability. May speaks of permission. And this is an important distinction uh, especially uh, that people need to understand. All mankind has permission and is commanded to come to Him. They have permission. But Jesus said, no man can come to me. Has the ability. Because man's nature, his will, as well as everything else in his makeup is corrupted by the fall and by sin. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You see. Well, obviously God knows it. Jesus knows it. And that's the reason he said, except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. Uh, verse uh, 65, he repeats this. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Man does not have the ability to come to Christ except there is one exception. A man, man wants to come up with all kinds of exceptions. God rejects all those exceptions that man can He said, there's only one exception. Given to me, given unto him of my Father. And so, back in John 3, 
when he's talking about condemned already. Um, he says in verse 21, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. That is consistent with the scripture. Those who come, come to the light, it's manifest that their deeds are wrought in God. And so that's our third point. God's grace. You're being justified freely by His grace. Grace is the only and all sufficient remedy for sin. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now remember that exception clause in John, except it was given to him of the Father. For by grace are you saved through faith. But we can't even boast in that. That is not from our ability. He said, but that's not of yourselves. That is a gift of God. Not of works. Not of anything that you and I can do. Not of anything, any price that we pay, any work that we do uh, in order to obtain salvation. We're justified freely by His grace. There's nothing that we can do. Not of works lest any man should boast, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. This is wrought in God. Unto good works. Now once we're saved, you know, it's God that worketh in you both the will and to do of His good pleasure. And you talk about, well, uh, what about my will? It's God that worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. The only way that we can do that which is pleasing to God is by His grace. And grace, the, part of the idea of grace, grace is that which enables us. Because I can do all things through Christ. You know, Christ enables us. His grace enables us. For by grace are you saved through faith. You see, it's God's grace that enables. It enables us to endure. It enables us to, uh, to do all things. Given to us by the Father. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, verse 1 through 3. Oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. So, well, if I have no money, how can I buy? You know, so you don't have any money. And, and that is our, now Naaman came prepared. He had money. He had silver. He had gold. He had valuable raiment, fine raiment, silks and, and what have you, which was uh, something of trade, something of value. And, and many transactions, this is how they paid for things back in, in that day. So he came prepared. But it was all useless. Everything that we have, everything that we bring, it is not sufficient to pay for it. He that, you know, have no money. You come ye. Buy, eat, yea. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. He said, Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me. Eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. There's, 
you know, when he says, come, buy without money. How do you buy something without money? He says, you come and you hear. And your soul shall live. That's how. Hear and your soul shall live. So in Romans chapter 10, see that's what Paul says. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, um, well it's verse 8. But what saith, what saith the scripture? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth the confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture said, Whosoever believeth on him, shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference. And again, he, he gets back to, he said, there's no difference. Jew, Gentile, black, white, it doesn't make any difference. We're all the descendants of Adam. In Adam we all fell. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no difference between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord, Overall is rich unto all that call upon him, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But I thought you said, you, you hear and your soul shall live. Well, uh, look at what Paul says. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them which preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. He said, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? They, the good news, the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, that He died for our sins. That He gave His life a ransom for ours. And it's offered freely to us. And we are to receive that by faith. He said, you, listen. Give ear to what I'm saying. Hear and thy soul shall live. And so that's what Paul is saying here. Verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Faith, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We have nothing to boast that we did that we were able to do, that we somehow helped God. God needed us to help Him by doing this or that. We're justified freely by grace, through His grace, through the redemption. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So if we look back Isaiah chapter 55. We drop down to verse 6 and 7. He says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. And so it, it says, seek and call. Your only hope. And, and see, Naaman came seeking. He, he heard there was a prophet, there was one in Israel that could heal him of his leprosy. And he came seeking. The scripture says, seek and you shall find. You know, 
And, and this is in that context where he said, come. If you're a thirst, come. If you have no money, that's fine. You, you come and you eat, you drink anyway. Because it's without price. He says, seek. Now, I can only speak of my experience of salvation. Others will have to speak for themselves. But I remember, and I had said under the preaching of, uh, of the Word of God for a, a while, and God had brought me under conviction. And one night at home, alone, in my bed in the dark, and I couldn't sleep because I was under conviction. I knew I had sinned against God. I knew I was worthy of death. I knew I was under condemnation. That if I died, when I died, my soul would be in hell. And I had heard the gospel preached. And I remember one verse in particular that the pastor had used as John 6.37 All that the Father giveth me will come to me and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And it was that second part of that verse that the Lord used. Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Seek him. You come to him. And you call upon him. Him to forgive you of your sins. That's what he's saying. So now everybody that hears this, not all have, you know, have believed the gospel. They've not all obeyed his word. But I admonish you, and I can promise you, by the word of God, if you will seek him, if you will come to him, and you will call upon him. That's why he says, call. Call out to him. Like the publican there in the temple, God be merciful to me, a sinner. God, you said you sent your son to die for my sin. I know I there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I have to offer you. But you promised that if I would come to you and, and call out to you for mercy, you sent your son to die for my sins, that you will forgive me of my sins and give me eternal life. And that's what I did that night. I called out to him. I basically, and this is kind of what the pastor taught. I just repeated back to God what God had said in his word to me. God cannot lie. He's made a promise. And, and the idea of faith is believing his promise. That if you'll come to him and you'll call out to him, he will forgive you of your sins. He will give you eternal life. He will make you his own child. That's all there is to it. And yet that is so simple and so easy that man thinks there's got to be more to it. There's got to be something I've got to do. And like Naaman, the, the natural inclination of man's nature is to resist the grace of God. And to want to do something themselves. They resist Humbling themselves and, and admitting their helplessness before Almighty God. Why is that so uh, humiliating when you compare yourself to Almighty God? He can certainly do more than I can. And then he says, forsake and return. Repentance and faith. That's what Paul said there in Acts. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. He said, I didn't hold back, keep back anything that was profitable unto you, but I taught you and uh, so on, said publicly and how to repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God is, is the idea of acknowledging my ways. And trying to work for my salvation, trying to please you in some way so that you will save me. I'm, I'm forsaking all of that. I'm acknowledging 
that my ways have been sinful. My ways are not your ways. And I'm putting my faith and trust. I'm returning to you and coming to you in faith that Jesus Christ died for my sins. Forsake your ways, your works. You're trying to earn salvation, trying to do something. Realize you can do nothing. That's okay because Jesus has done everything. He paid it all. Just trust Him and receive from Him your salvation which is offered to you freely. It's offered to you freely. All you do is receive it. You know, it's like someone comes up to you and has a gift in their hand and they just hand it to you. They, they hold it out to you. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to do something. All you do is receive it. Take a hold of it. Take it to yourself. The last, very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, the very last chapter, verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Come. And I was talking about here calling him, come to him. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. Well, he said there in Isaiah, if you're thirsty. Without money, without price. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Let that sink in. If you're a thirst, if you desire to be saved, if you desire to have the forgiveness of sin, if you desire to have everlasting life, to be accepted of God and made one of His children, come, take from His hand that which He offers freely. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. All right, like Stand at this time.